here today with Karine Vanderbeck, uh, who is an assistant professor at Ben Gurion University in, in Israel. And she's also one of our grantees for uh, a grant titled Technology Skill Complementarity on the Eve of the Industrial Revolution. Um, the question, uh, well, welcome, Karine. The, the question you're asking, I think, is whether technological change um, was complementary or a substitute for skill. What was most interesting to me about your project is this data source that you're, that you're using, um, that you have these records of, uh, in, what are they called, indentures? Yeah, indenture contracts. Yeah. It's actually contracts between uh, apprentices and masters. Yes. So when a parent or a guardian uh, puts him, his son into apprenticeship with a master, they sign a contract, it's called an indenture. But what, what I have is not really the indentures themselves, but registers from, uh, from the stamp tax that was uh, put on, uh, on, on, on the premium or the tuition that was paid by the parent to the master for these, app for these apprenticeships. So the way I yeah. view these premiums is, uh, is uh, uh, some kind of present value of the, of the, um, uh, of the wages or the income, uh, uh, of the flow of income that the parent is expecting for his child over time, over some time. This, the, the time period we're talking about is 1710 to 1772. So you you have a time series, I guess, of these of these contracts. So you're looking at how the uh, the cost of these of tuition changed over time, and also the number of these things changed over time. There are some dimensions to it. So it's a type of a panel data, and it also has it has the special aspect because what I have in the register actually is information about I have with all the names and everything, but I know the name of the apprentice, the name of the master he was apprenticed to, the master's occupation and location, and then the amount that was paid, and the year or date, of course. So I have the time aspect, I have the occupational aspect, and the location, the mm -hmm. geographical aspect. And is this and then, all, is this in Britain, or where is this? And it's, it's for all over England. And so they save these records somewhere. They, they, yeah, they, I mean, where are I, they? Where, so they're sitting yeah, in the. It, it's in the national. It was very easy to get. In fact, I was uh, uh, Gregory Clark from UC Davis was exactly working on his book, and I, there was a, I was in a little workshop where he was presenting the, the chapters of the book, and the, the, his basic one of his basic claims was that all the story of human capital and technological change has nothing to do with the industrial revolution, and I said no, this is. Not possible. It's not possible because it makes a lot of sense that when there's technological change, there's a certain demand for skills. And that, that should be universal. That should be true for today. It should be true for the Industrial Revolution. It should be true anywhere. And, mm -hmm. and, this, and the more I went into this story, the more I understood that the view that the Industrial Revolution was this killing was a view that was not really based on any quantitative data. I mean, we don't, what's, what does the data really say? We don't really know. So I was just you know, I just went to Manchester and I went into all these factories, the first factories, and tried to find the wages. And then, but eventually I saw that it's, in order to really prove something like this, you need something more systematic. I, I realized that there's this source of uh, apprenticeship, but historians just mention a you know, few examples from it. Nobody ever took this whole data set and, and analyze it systematically. Yeah. But this data must be in different places and you have no, to no, wander no. around. No, 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 it's all, it's it's all, all very collected. organized and uh, because it's, 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 in the national, it's in the National uh, Archives in, the, in, yeah. in, in, in London. So this first part that I'm working on at the moment is, uh, was easier because it was, uh, it was indexed by genealogists in the beginning of the 20th century. And so the idea, or your hypothesis, if I have this straight, is that, just take an example, okay, that the issue here is making the thread, okay? And so it's, it's mechanizing this by creating uh, spinning wheels, mechanized spinning wheels of some kind. And uh, the point is that uh, we need workers to make the spinning wheels themselves. And so it takes skill to do this. Exactly. Okay. And so what do you find? Or have you found anything yet, actually? Are you, how far at, at this, are you? No, at this stage, I can already say yeah. quite a lot. I mean, the, the, the interesting bit was, first of all, the data requires a lot of processing to classify occupations and decide uh, how you classify occupations. And because what I'm seeing is really only skilled people. So I cannot really see the effect on unskilled to skilled. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, I had to think a lot of how I analyze the data in order to still make a certain point. So mm -hmm. my basic idea was that if there's an increase in the labor, in, in the demand in the labor market for skilled people, then in the short run, there will be an increase in demand 
for certain for this type of occupations in the human capital markets and then what we will see will first be an increase in quantity so what was really interesting to see was that the technological change had a very strong effect on uh, on on these mechanical non-routine workers relative to all the other occupations mm. but what was stronger was that once i uh, once i controlled for the the increase in the manufacturing sector then the technological change had a, f a positive effect on skills in general. Mm. That means that the number mm. of apprenticeship grows because of technological change. Well, so this, this sounds, uh, <laughs> this is really quite fascinating, digging this out from what's something that happened hundreds of years ago. Um, so this is economic history yes. uh, of a particularly sort of quantitative type. Um, and um, so have you always been doing economic history? You were, you were an undergraduate in economics at uh, the, uh, the Hebrew, Hebrew University, University of Jerusalem. And uh, did you do economic history then? Well, I started, I started doing my BA and my MA. Uh, and during my MA, I, uh, I encountered uh, the courses of uh, Professor Oded Gallo, who teaches in Brown today. But he's not an economic historian. No, he's, he's an economist. He's yes. a growth economist. Yes. And he was working then on his unified growth theories. And I was very much affected by him, by his personality, by his views, by uh, this whole idea of looking into growth in a very simplified type of uh, way, mm -hmm. but also with this internal dynamic that made a lot of sense to me. And so I was first thinking of doing my, my PhD in, in growth theory, but at a certain stage I got exposed to economic history, and then I was thinking, no, if I really want to understand growth, I want to go back to this moment where where it starts, and it starts 200 years ago. It's, I mean, it starts a thousand years ago, some say. So, mm -hmm. and I really, I, I would, and because I think I always had a passion for history already from before high school. I think I was always very attracted to history. So it, it kind of fit in personally and professionally, and everything mm -hmm. looked like this was the right path for me, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so I went back, and I thought, okay, when did Europe start diverging? When did the West become different and all you know all the books say it's something in the 10th 11th century so I went to the 10th and 11th century and I studied Latin and I decided I'm going to look at water mills because that's this huge investment in capital suddenly so I thought oh, let's see why yeah so <laughs> this was your PhD dissertation that was my PhD yeah and uh, so this new work uh, builds on that although it's not it's I don't know 400 years later or something the, the eve of the industrial revolution um, so are you working your way toward the present? No, no. There's enough interesting, very interesting things and questions uh, about the Industrial Revolution and about the earlier mm -hmm. periods that are fascinating mm -hmm. for economists and for economic historians and for historians and for people in general. But I must say that, that, that once you go into, when I, once I started going into this topic of, uh, of uh, of skill bias technological change and kind of hoping that to find the theories just ready lying there in the modern economics, I found out that there's lots of problems and unsolved problems in the in the research today as well. Mm -hmm. That I hope my research can also maybe can inspire can some inspire and theoretical and, developments. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, this is really fascinating combination of of, of history and economic theory um, to questions that are actually relevant, of course, today and going back to the dusty books to, to, to find the answers. Um, so we look forward to seeing the results of this, and we're, I'm very happy we're supporting this. And, uh, and it's very nice to meet you and to welcome you Thank to you. the stable of INET Economists. I'm very glad to be part of this very, very important initiative. Mm -hmm.